And welcome back to the footy show. Depression affects one in five people, and if you're not a sufferer, there's a likelihood that someone you care about is. There's a stigma attached to depression, and suicide can be perceived as selfish. But depression is a disease and not something you should be frightened about. We're trying to destigmatize the issue in rugby league, but players are still in an environment where mental toughness, being one of the boys, resilience, are almost performance descriptors. This is an issue I feel strongly about, having personally had my own battle with what I call the black cloud, something I decided to speak publicly about with Andrew Denton back in 2005. Getting through the other side is about being brave enough to speak out and to seek help. Sadly, we lost two young players to suicide last year. That's too, too many. In this special footy show story, we're trying to break the cycle and give hope to anyone who may be suffering. Retired rugby league hero Preston Campbell was an icon in our game, one of our most respected and loved players. He achieved it all during his 14-year career. Watching you as a player, you look like the happiest player out there. Were you always happy in playing? I was always happy a, a lot of the time. I played for 14 years, I think, um, and for, I dare say, 13. 13 of those years, you know, probably some of the best times of my life. But with the highs come the lows, and for Preston, that came in 2001. A series of changes at his club left him unsure of his future. And for a man that played rugby league as a way to provide for his family, the threat of losing that left him feeling disillusioned and lost. I didn't know where my spot was, or my place was in rugby league. Um, I didn't know whether I, I belonged in the in rugby league anymore. Um, I just felt like I, I didn't want to be around there anymore. And the struggle, was it mainly around the football club at the time, or was that bleeding into your personal life? I kind of started coming home moody, depressed, mm. upset all the time. The kids and, and, and my partner at the time, um, she, they were all invisible to me. So wow. I didn't know at the time that I was, uh, that I was neglecting them. And um, it's just strange looking back now. Um, I just couldn't see myself mm. being that person, mm. you know. Um, yeah, it's just very, very tough. What did you think was going on at the time? I had no idea. I just thought that I wasn't needed. Um, I thought that I was no good. Um, I felt like I was worth, worthless, um, that nobody needed me around anymore. And, um, yeah, it was just so, so dark. Preston's life was sinking lower and lower. He'd just split up with his partner Lee and two children, Jaden and Taylor. It was on this country road just outside of Ballina. With feelings of utter confusion and anger, the Preston took matters into his own hands. He deliberately and consciously drove himself into a tree at 80 k's an hour, the intention to end his life. Where exactly are we? Um, well, this is basically where the, the accident had happened. Um, this tree. is the tree that um, almost put an end to me. Okay, what do you remember after you hit the tree? I remember just before I hit the tree, there was a car coming over, and I hit the tree, and I, I put my seatbelt back on, and then parked on the other side. And that was the first first man. I mean, I never never got his name. I don't know who he was. It's kind of weird actually standing here now. We've been here for a little while talking about it because I, I myself, haven't showed anyone. I was really, I didn't really have time to, um, I guess, come back. Or well, I don't know whether I had the courage to come back and and just actually stand here and think, mate, you're very very lucky. Being here in the exact spot which could have ended Preston's life is eerie enough. But what happens next is one of the most amazing coincidences I have ever seen. While we're filming, a man pulls up to speak to us. He explains that it was his car that pulled over that night. This is the man that saved Preston's life. His is the voice that Preston remembers. 
Finally meeting each other after 12 years, the emotion that comes flooding back for both of them is extraordinary. Can I just say thank you? Jesus, mate. Sorry, I'm just... Please, I'm... I'm when I arrived here about seven or eight years ago, you were, I couldn't get a pulse and I couldn't get a new breath or anything, and I, I thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. <laughs> I just seriously thought you were dead and I grabbed your head really carefully and put, tilted your head back and you started, you coughed and you started to breathe and I knew you were alive. When I was able to breathe I was actually, I was awake and I could hear you. There was petrol spurting out everywhere and I thought I could have left you in the car, that you, the car would catch fire and if I didn't tilt you back you would have died anyway because you weren't breathing so I just had to take a bit of a chance. Lovely to meet you. No, Chris. thank you and very I've much. I've followed your, your career with a lot of interest. I no. really enjoyed watching you play. Thanks, mate. And particularly. So, what's your name? It's at Brendan. 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 Yeah. It was a miracle that Preston survived that day, and meeting Brendan for the first time after so many years, and hearing how close he came to death, is incredibly confronting. That's. That's. Yeah. I mean, I've. I've it's been a long time since I, I feel like this, you know, it's just, I guess seeing him and when I saw this guy pull up, I said to myself, this is, this is not the guy and, and I heard that he mentioned to the guys that he was the bloke that had come to me and exactly what he explained just now, I remember, remember that stuff and he was the guy that done it, so. It's amazing. That was freaky. You alright? I'm just, I'm just glad I was able to meet him. I do miss Sydney though. Yeah. Like, the harsh reality of suicide are the loved ones left Sydney. behind. Yeah. But and for Shanice Alasa and her 11 month old better. daughter Taya, they live with this reality every day. He, he looks so chilled in all these photos, doesn't he? He was very relaxed. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it drove me a bit insane because he was a bit too relaxed. <laughs> On the 28th of February 2013, the rugby league world was shattered when young Tigers player Mosisi Fotoweka committed suicide. He was just 20 years old. Mosisi, or as his teammates called him Moses, had a promising career ahead of him. He'd been elevated from the under-20s to the top grade for the Tigers, but his dream of making a great debut was ruined by injury when the young prop tore a pectoral muscle and was facing months on the sideline. It was a normal day. I woke up, normal routine. He went to training early. Last thing he actually said to me, he gave me a kiss and said, I love you. So I thought that was nice. And um, I had an ultrasound that morning because we were trying to find out the sex of Taya. Then on the way home, Ben told me that he had got injured, so he was probably just upset. And I was like, oh no. So I just sent him a text saying, you know, it's going to be all right. Um, ben told me he got injured, been there. We'll get through it. And yeah, silence all throughout the day. Yeah. What happened when you got home? I remember running into the house and I saw his phone, it was charging and like his boots and his bag. He dropped it all down by the couch and um, he, wasn't, he wasn't answering me and I ran upstairs, it wasn't in the room. I ran downstairs and I noticed that the garage door was open and there was light coming through. And yeah, he was, he was in the garage. I remember screaming out his name and uh, I knew it was already too late. How did you get through the day of the funeral? I got to spend more time with him because we had a service at his house where he was actually at the house. I didn't want that night to end because I knew then it was coming to really saying goodbye to him. The worst part was when they were actually lowering his coffin. I wanted to scream and dive in there because I just was like, no, don't take him away from me. <laughs> I just couldn't believe that I had just 
buried the father of my child. That's not it wasn't meant to happen that way. Did you ever notice with Moses that he was suffering from depression or was there anything that gave you an inkling? He had his moments. Now that I look back, I'd say, yeah, they were signs. Um, just especially when he got injured, he didn't cope with injuries well at all. He was really down in the dumps. I would have never caught it depressed, mm -hmm. but he, he blamed himself and he always wished that he was harder. While you're depressed, you don't see anything or anyone in the world other than yourself, do you? And that's what comes across to the public as it being selfish or it being, why can't you, you tell us what's going on? But it, it's such a, you're in your own little world. It's one of those things, I mean, people look at it as selfish, you know, and when I sort of come to understand what it was, in the early days I was disgusted with myself, what, the way I treated people, you know, in particular my family. And then I come to understand that it, it is something that I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help. And one day you'll explain what Daddy did? Yes, unfortunately. She's missing a very important person in her life. And I want her to give her everything and I can't give her that. So I'll do my best to explain it, why he's not here. And I hope she can understand it. <laughs> Welcome back to our special footy show story on depression in rugby league. In part two, we hear about Rennie Matua's battle with depression and suicide and the remarkable story of how his teammate and best friend saved his life. It's Matua, he's having a big night, Rennie Matua, back himself to the line. And that is Matua. Rennie Matua has scored... Rugby league star Rennie Matua has achieved things in his career that others could only dream of. But like Moses and Preston, he's also struggled with the demons of depression. Dealing with an ongoing injury, the pressures of captaining a losing team and an uncertain playing future, Rennie gave in to his overwhelming sadness and he broke down in the dressing rooms of Suncorp Stadium on August 16 last year, two days before he attempted suicide. As I came into the sheds, I just broke down t in tears and I'm, I wasn't sure why. I just had no clue why I was so upset. The macho -ness of a football player, everyone, you know, we're supposed to be bulletproof humans that are tough and go through it. And I've never been a person that would sort of show my emotion like that. And, and it was, that was, that was the embarrassing thing for me. I felt embarrassed. If, why I was, I didn't know why I was so upset and um, it was just like a, a pressure valve getting released, it was just, it all came out and I couldn't stop it. And that leads to August 18, what are your thoughts of that day? It was a thought that came into my head a lot, I couldn't understand why I kept thinking about ending my life and some days it, it'd come and then I'd snap out of it pretty quickly and then for weeks and weeks and weeks it just gradually got worse and worse and then to the point where I thought about it every day. Every single day I'd lay in bed thinking that um, I was better off not being alive, um, that I was a disappointment to myself and to my family and to the people around me and it was like this parasite in my head just telling me that I wasn't good enough, um, that I'd been an underachiever in my career and there was a point where I just thought, yep, I've had enough, it's time to go. I remember thinking about just my family, that I couldn't get my family, couldn't get my mum's face out of my head, but the pain that I was in for a long period of time I just couldn't handle anymore. What were, your, what were your final thoughts? Do you remember? The final things I remember is just trying to get that last bit of breath in, you know. 
That's the last things I remember. As Rennie was drawing his last breath, fate kicked in. His teammate and best friend Willie Tonga was unable to sleep that night and was awake to receive a phone call from Rennie's sister Megan, concerned over a text message she'd received from Rennie. From that point on, Willie's intuition kicked in. I was laying in bed, not knowing what to do, and then something just told me just to get up and drive to his house. So I um, you know, I got dressed as quick as I could. I drove to his unit as quick as I could. Um, put him at 2.30 and I saw, I pulled up out the front and I saw his light on in his room. Um, I walked over to, I ran over to his room um, just underneath and I yelled out to him and I could hear music in the background and then it stopped and so when I heard the music stop I ran around to the to the main entrance of the of the unit. Um, it was open, like usually it's ne it's never open. And then I went straight to Rennie's room and opened his room, and then that's when I just saw Rennie um, trying to take his own life. How long was there in you not getting there that? Rennie might have taken his if I, rec I reckon if I was five seconds later um, we wouldn't be having this conversation wow um, he wasn't with it at the time like, it's like when someone comes out of out of water for a breath of air that's how his um, reaction was to that my next thoughts were you know like I was crying and all I kept saying to Willie is that I don't want to I don't want to leave anymore. I don't want to leave, and um, he didn't leave my side till till it would have been daylight. Why Willie was awake that night, we'll never know. But it's something that Rennie will always be grateful for. This is the first time they will sit down together and talk about August 18, the night Willie saved his best friend's life. What about what he did that night? Yeah, I um. We haven't really spoken about it too much. It's not something we like to talk about. But I feel like I wish I did more to help him because of what he had to see and, and what I put him through. So. And do you feel guilty, in a way, through what he went through? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. The next couple of days after it, I was really mad and like I was thinking that's selfish. Like, you've got so much behind here. Like, you know, your family. That's when. I started to realise that depression is a disease. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that he was... He had that. This is a phenomenal friendship you guys have got. He's always been... the angel on my shoulder, though. Not the devil. He's always tried to keep me on the right path. I don't think he realises how, how much of a special person he is. I honestly don't believe he, he realises that and it's more than a friendship, you know, he, he's my brother. Suicide is preventable and Preston and Rennie are proving to be the hope that the next generation of players need by bravely telling their stories. Preston makes his way to all NRL clubs educating players on the signs of depression. Firstly, thanks for letting me come down today, have a yarn with you guys. Suicide is... It's mind-blowing. It's the biggest killer of our men in, in Australia. <laughs> and through Suicide Prevention Australia, Rennie is raising awareness. Footy players don't, don't have depression or they don't go through the same things that we're above everyone, but we're just as human as everyone else. Their message is simple. Education, awareness and communication. Their motivation? to never see another player go through what they have and for the lives of the players we've lost to not be in vain. Sometimes it seems that people think, you know, just because we're footy players, uh, we don't go through the same situations that other people do. Uh, footy players are affected by it just as much as anyone else. I think that's a massive message, you know, being, being able to feel comfortable, to be able to talk to someone they trust and, and someone who's willing to listen. 
the clubs especially can make it more of an open issue and uh, make guys feel like it's the norm to be able to talk about it, not something that it, to be insecure about. So I think that's a big thing. What do you say to the bloke out there, the big tough bloke who's got issues and doesn't speak? Well, I think for footballers, anyone can be tough, you know? Um, but it doesn't take a tough man to come forward and say you need help. It takes a strong man. Um, telling my story might not reach everyone, but it may reach one or two people, and that's that for me is the reason why I do it. You probably never thought you'd suffer from depression. I never thought I would suffer from it. Are we doing enough? Are we too scared of it? Suicide's not a word that people like to speak about too often. It's just knowing the indicators of when people might be depressed. That that's what people need to be more uh, aware of and educated on. Don't keep it to yourself, you know. It's not something embarrassing, if anything. You're the stronger person for actually admitting that there's something that you need help with. I hope that people can learn from those situations because I wouldn't want any family to lose someone like that when it can be prevented. Ready for two up. He scores for the dogs. They're piling them on. And straight away it's Matua. He's having a big one. Ready for two up. Back himself to Both Rennie and Preston have been diagnosed with forms of depression and through medication and counselling they're lucky to be here to tell their stories. What about the, the, the gratitude you must feel? the second chance you've been given with your family. Well, you know that, that old saying, um, you don't know what you've lost until it's gone. You know, I never really understood it. I really understand it now. You know, the, the fact that I'm alive, I'm grateful for that. The fact that I've got a, a beautiful wife, um, beautiful family, and I've got people that love me. Uh, you know, what's there, what more to be grateful about, you know? I just feel, I know the life's not perfect, but I feel it feels very close to perfect. Just my whole outlook on life, you know, just the clarity I have in life now. I've learnt, you know, to communicate with people again. Will's introduced me to a, a girl, and so, yeah, no, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy at the moment. <laughs> That's official now. <laughs> Sadly for Shanice and Taya, there's no second chance. And life will never be the same. There will always be unanswered questions, but Shanice has learned to accept Moses' death and is hopeful that by sharing his story, it may save at least one person's life. I'm happy where I am. And I hope that... Moses, wherever he is, like he's proud of me and he's proud of what I'm doing with Taya because it's not easy, but I'm doing as best I can. I'm sure he'd be very proud. He better be. <laughs> <laughs>